All right, physics students, uh, welcome to the, your first video in um, topic 4.4, which is wave behavior. And what I'm going to first do is I'm going to talk about something we've already talked about a bit in class, and that is reflection and transmission of waves uh, when they encounter um, a different, different sort of medium, okay? So remember that when a wave hits a boundary be between two different media, two things can happen. Number one, the, the wave can either be reflected or bounces, or the wave can be transmitted, okay? Now, the most obvious and common application of this is if you think about uh, like a laser beam going from glass into uh, air or vice versa or into water and so forth. Remember the laser beam, we treat uh, light as a wave in this particular case. Okay, so you can see that depending on the angle of incidence, um, the wave can either be reflected, um, transmitted or completely reflected internally okay and often in real life obviously reflection and transmission both occur and we've seen this and the amount each of each depends on the nature of the media and the initial angles okay the wave can also be absorbed but we're not really going to talk about that right now at this point okay all right um, so if you consider um, water dropping into a tank through this simulation you see that water is reflected uh, if it's if the wave fronts are circular when they hit this barrier over here you can see that the water waves are reflected in a circular fashion back towards where they came from if you have uh, traveling waves or um, continuous waves you get a really interesting sort of wave pattern here where you see areas of constructive and destructive interference because the reflected waves are interfering or interacting with the incident waves in a very very typical fashion okay uh, just a couple of things to note, and that is that uh, when the waves are reflected, the frequency and the speed do not change. Okay, that's a really important thing to realize. And of course, like I said, if the waves are continuous, the reflections interfere with the original waves, as you see in the right hand, um, the right side of the diagram here. Okay. Now, if you're talking about waves on a string, something really interesting happens, um, and that is that the uh, transverse waves in particular become inverted when they're reflected okay uh, and we'll talk about this more maybe later and I'll see this in class with slinkies which of course transverse waves on slinkies behave in a very similar fashion as they do on ropes okay and notice how the continuous reflected waves again interfere with the original waves coming behind them this will be very important when we talk about uh, section 4.5 which is um, standing waves coming up next okay Okay, now the law of reflection is very, very easy, and it just states that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, okay? And remember when we're talking about waves um, bouncing off of a surface or hitting a surface, the angle in question is always the angle relative to the normal, okay? So if you observe, for example, a laser into glass from a less dense to a more dense substance, you'll see how the reflected angle... Um, you see how this angle here and this angle over here are both the same. You also see in this particular demo, you're seeing the transmitted beam going through it, and you're seeing properly that that transmitted or refracted beam is bent towards the normal because it's going from a less optically dense to a more optically dense substance. Okay, and we've seen that, and we've seen that before. Okay, now I'm going to formally derive Snell's law for you, even though we've talked about it a bit in class. Remember that refraction is the change in direction of a wave when traveling from one medium to another due to a change in the wave speed, okay? And we've said before that all waves refract. The frequency doesn't change, but the speed does. And because of the wave equation, uh, that means that the wavelength uh, also changes, okay? So the wavelength is actually shorter inside the medium than it was outside, okay? So the frequency is higher, okay? All right, so you know that water waves change direction from one depth to another. They go slower in shallower water. And of course, with light waves, they change direction when entering a more dense substance, and they go slower in the denser substance. And we've talked about all of this before, okay? All right, now I'm going to show you again the demo of the laser beam in glass, but this time I want you to watch the transmitted beam. As I've alluded to before, and we've actually seen, this transmitted beam is actually refracted towards the normal. Of course, when it's when theta 1 is 0, it just goes straight through, and theta 2 is also 0. Okay. Now, knowing that the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second in a vacuum, and in all other media, it's less than that, um, and that V depends on the optical density of the media through which light is passing, um, because the light slows down, it's going to also change direction. So hence the light wave refracts when going from the air to the glass, um, or from air to water, or any other 
media that have different optical densities, okay? Um, now, any wave is bent towards the normal if going from a region of higher speed to a region of lower speed. It's bent away from the normal of going from a region of lower speed to a region of higher speed, okay? Um, so this is really just a different way of saying everything that we've um, said before. And of course, usually some of the wave is reflected and some refracted. And just to kind of bring you back to the real world here, why do ocean waves break the way they do? Well, what, what their wave fronts are actually refracted because they go from deep to shallow water right before they get to the shores. So that's why you see all these kinds of interesting patterns of ocean wave fronts um, along like a smooth sandy beach where, they, where the increase in depth is quite uniform from the beach to the deep water, okay? Okay, now, for light, every optically transparent material has what's called an index of refraction, and in physics, this is lowercase n. And n is given as the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the media. Now, since the speed of light in the media is always less than the speed of light um, in, a, in, a, in a vacuum, n is always going to be a number greater than 1. Okay, and in fact, you can see the indices of refraction for various substances here. It's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Again, it, uh, it mainly it's mainly determined by the molecular structure um, of, of these particular substances, and we're not going to actually get so much into that in this class, okay? So, labeling this diagram, you have N1, N2. Typically, we talk about theta1 and N1 in the, subs in, the, um, in the material from which the light ray is originally coming. We denote the subscript um, 2 for that being the material into which the wave is traveling, okay? Um, so n depends on, on the wavelength, and rays with the same angle of incidence but with different wavelengths will therefore be bent differently. This is called dispersion, and this is what results in the beautiful rainbow pa pattern from prisms. And if you're a Pink Floyd fan, of course, you know this album cover from the dark side of the moon. Okay? All right. Now, Snell's law states that n1 sine theta1 equals n2 sine theta2. From your data booklet, it's actually written like this, but of course it's the same thing. And what's interesting is the data booklet also includes a ratio of speeds here, okay? So n1 over n2 is equal to v2 over v1, where v2 is the, is the, speed, of the, um, is the speed of the light in the second material into which it's passing, and v1 is the speed... Um, outside before it actually um, gets to that point, okay? So you can see that N1 equals C over V1 and N2 equals C over V2. And the derivation goes something like this. In order to understand how Snell's law comes about, you have to draw wave fronts of the incoming wave and wave fronts of the refracted wave, as well as their associated rays, both outside and inside of the substance, or from medium 1 to media 2. Okay, so if you construct your geometry like this, where you've labeled points A, B, C, and D, okay, you can see very clearly that if this angle is theta 1, this angle must also be theta 1 um, through geometry, because these are similar triangles, and similarly, theta 2 is here, and this angle here must be theta 2. Now, you can see that the sine of theta 1 would be the line segment AB over line segment BC, and the sine of theta 2 is CD over BC. Now, if we divide the two, sine of theta 1 over sine of theta 2, we have AB over CD, but AB is really lambda 1 and CD is really lambda 2, okay? Now, knowing that C1 is C over M N1, which is F times lambda 1, and uh, similar fashion for C2, we note that this ratio, as we had before, is now C over N1F all over C over N2F, which, of course, using algebra, ends up being N2 over N1. So therefore, sine of theta 1 over sine of theta 2 is N2 over N1, which, of course, is Snell's law, um, as given to you in the IB data book that right up here. Okay. Notice that this says nothing about the ratio of the speeds in the different media, um, but the reality is you know, when you do most of your problem solving, um, you're going to use this version of Snell's law right here or this version up here. It's obviously all the same thing. Okay. All right. So let's do an example here. A ray of light is incident in water at an angle of 30 and 70 on a water glass plane surface. Calculate theta 2 or the angle of refraction in the glass, and it really helps you to draw a diagram in these cases. I really, really recommend that you do, okay? So very simple diagram. In case 1 with 30 degrees, the angle is 25.9. At 70, it's 55.3. You can see in both cases that theta 2 is properly less than theta 1 because um, the index of refraction of glass is greater than that of air, or glass is more optically dense, so that uh, that that 
ray of light is uh, refracted towards the normal in both cases. Okay, here's another one. Sketch the path of the light ray shown below. In this case, it's going from, uh, from air to glass to water to glass and then coming back out again. It's kind of interesting. And I'm asking you to determine the angle at which the ray exits the bottom glass. Okay, so again, here's my diagram. Okay, so here's theta 1, theta 2. So um, going, from, going from air to glass, it's refracted towards the normal. From glass to water, it's refracted away from the normal because water is less optically dense than glass. Okay, and then back towards the normal, and then of course from glass to air, it's refracted very far away from the normal. Okay, and basically what you want to do is just break down uh, these series of different angles the way I've shown here. So I've got theta 2, 3, 4, and 5, and it turns out that theta 5 ends up being 30 degrees, which is very interesting. You see some symmetry here. That's exactly the same as the initial angle that it entered, and because you're going glass, water, glass, water. Or, sorry, glass, water, glass, air, right? So there's a symmetry in materials from top to bottom. Really, really interesting stuff, okay? I want to talk real briefly about something called total internal reflection, okay? This is an important part of the IIB. You guys need, need, need to know this and be able to both qualitatively and quantitatively um, calculate this, okay? Now, remember, waves can be transmitted or or and or reflected, okay? Now, if we talk about a case where the wave goes from a higher uh, index of refraction to a lower one, so for this case, notice how this is now reversed. I'm going from water underneath up into air up above. So I have my N1 underneath and my N2 up above now, okay? So that's a real, that's real different from what I've done um, before. So make sure that you note that, okay? Also note that now N1 is greater than N2. So first of all, you know from the rules of refraction that um, theta 2 is going to be greater than theta 1 because it's going from a more optically dense to a less optically dense substance. Okay, so it's going to be refracted away from the normal. All right, it turns out that funny things... Of funny things can happen when I vary theta 1 and I can vary theta 1 to the point where all of where there's no transmitted beams so there's no refracted ray whatsoever and all of that incident beam down here is then reflected within the water okay and if you're a swimmer or if you've done uh, like snorkeling or diving or whatever, you've noticed that when you're underwater, like on a sunny day, you can see total internal reflection. Um, you can see the reflection of fish on the underside of the surface of the ocean, for example. Um, so it's got a really cool application in um, nature, okay? Now, specifically, again, if the wave goes from higher end to lower end, part is reflected internally and part is transmitted away from the normal. As theta 1 increases, theta 2 eventually gets lower and it ends up being 90 degrees it ends up being a right a right angle okay now at that at that exact point where theta 2 equals 90 we have what's called total internal reflection because really theta 2 really that beam is going along the surface if I get if theta 1 goes even beyond that then um, then th even that beam doesn't even appear that's that's actually along the surface of the water now this special angle is called the critical angle and it's denoted theta C okay all right. Now, for theta 1 greater than theta c, as I just said, all of the wave is reflected internally. In this case, there's no wave transmitted, and it's called total internal reflection. Okay. Now, we can use Snell's law to actually find what the critical angle is, noting that n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. If we take, for example, water and air, here n1 is 1.33 and n2 is 1 because it's air. Okay. I set up uh, Snell's law as such, where theta 2, I set it equal to 90. And of course, sine of 90 um, is going to be 1, so that's pretty easy to deal with. So I do a little trigonometry and algebra here, and I solve for the critical angle. I get 48.8 degrees. Okay. Now, if you increase theta 1 again beyond the critical angle, for example, if I take theta 1 to be, say, 52.5, then what happens, if you look at my math here, you end up with something that is impossible, right? Um, because the sine can't be greater than 1, so, um, so that's an error. So that's, that's actually proof of that, right, mathematically. Note that there, again, there is no refracted ray when theta 1 is greater than theta c. It's called total internal reflection, and this only occurs when the wave goes from an optically more dense medium to less dense, or in other words, n1 is greater than n2.
Okay, just a few examples before we wrap up this video. Examples of total internal reflection, as I've talked about under the ocean. It's really, really cool stuff, okay? I don't know if you've ever noticed this effect of uh, like droplets falling in sunlight. Some of the droplets are really, really abnormally bright. Um, and it's because there's total internal reflection happening inside the water droplets in the sunlight. Again, if you, uh, if you shine a laser through a piece of plastic, you can get total internal reflection that way. And a really cool application of this one, okay, is the propagation of digital signals in what we call optical fibers, okay? So these are signals where, that are really electromagnetic waves that carry information. And there's very, very little loss of amplitude through these cables, these fiber optic cables, because you have total internal reflection, okay? And maybe you've seen these fiber optic cables. Um, they're really fun to play with, and they also have a very, very important use in terms of long-term um, transport of um, digital information.